Thank you, Lee Jay. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Steve Bambera from the Department of Entomology. He's going to be doing a presentation on pests of the urban tree. Steve, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Lucy, and thanks for the promotion. Uh, I'm enjoying this. I've got my shoes off and my feet up. So um, those of you who can't hear this or get it, you're probably better off. So I think that this topic has been kind of neglected a little bit over the last few years. And uh, really, there is uh, a need for it. So uh, just decided that we would kind of touch on this. And we don't have nearly enough time to cover this whole uh, area of pests and urban trees. It's just too much stuff. But we'll do a little bit of an overview here. And then if you've got questions, we can uh, deal with those questions. And um, hopefully, that will help you out. So I divided this up into just four groups, because these are the four groups that I think would most likely get you the most questions or that you would see the most problems on. So I just picked scale insects, galls on oaks. There's galls on all sorts of stuff, but the oaks seem to be the most dramatic and most noticeable to a lot of people. Then we'll talk about some of the defoliators and then those little borers and stuff. So the scale insects, those of you are probably pretty familiar with it, it's somewhere or another. And scale insects really don't even look like insects. And you rarely even see the actual insect. You see the covering of the scale. And that can be pretty indicative of the type of scale that you've got uh, for identification. And the scales, entomologists have broken scales down into soft or armored scales. And the soft scales generally have a soft armor. And the armored scales generally have a hard armor. So uh, you ought to be able to catch on to that. And uh, they have different characteristics to them. Some are you know, tend to be worse than others. And we can't go through them all. But certain scales may cause uh, a, a branch to die back, for example. So it could be serious. It could be a little bit more than just cosmetic. And uh, some, particularly the soft scales, may also create honeydew. I think you're familiar with that. And in an urban setting, the honeydew can be a problem or a complaint by a homeowner or a, a town or something like that. And then. There are scales on lots of trees, and, and oftentimes they are not noticed. But if a tree becomes stressed, the scales either multiply better and or are noticed a little bit more. So they tend to be a little bit stress related. Going on to the honeydew, I think lots of you are familiar with honeydew related to aphids. And some of the scales will produce this honeydew. So uh, particularly if you have trees along the street, or maybe even just in your yard, and the tree is dropping a lot of honeydew, or the, the scale or aphids are dropping a lot of honeydew onto a car or some service like that that people use, then that can be a bit of a problem. So besides check getting in your car every, well, in my case, I park under an oak tree. And when I leave in the afternoon, uh, lots of times I have honeydew all over my windshield. So that's certainly one indicator. But if you see ants climbing up a tree, you know, they have really no reason to be up that tree uh, as far as uh, their business. But if there are aphids or scale or honeydew up on that tree, then they are interested. So if you see ants in a tree climbing up the bark, then you have reason to suspect something. I've also seen yellow jackets, for example, visiting uh, shrubs that have lots of honeydew and scale insects. Of course, be careful that there's not actually a yellow jacket nest inside that shrub, but uh, just be careful. So these can be indicators of a scale or even a, an aphid problem. So for scale management, particularly remember here we are dealing in the urban environment. So we want to use things that are effective and safe. So the horticultural oils 
are great choices for this. They are effective. Uh, they are effective as as effective as most of the other products. Uh, we call them safer because, in the sense that the product, an active ingredient, is a, a lot safer. But it also is not very persistent in the environment, and it is much kinder on some of the beneficials. So the horticultural oils are somewhat specific, and I use the term somewhat because they will kill lots of different little soft-bodied critters that are out there, but they are very timing dependent. So you have to know what scale you've got, really, and know when the crawler stage is out, which is the vulnerable stage with no protection, and apply the horticultural oils at that time. So they are specific because of the timing that you are using. And uh, the other part of this, that once it has dried, it is basically innocuous. So it's a contact insecticide for soft-bodied, fragile insects, and it is timing dependent. And once it's dried, then it is no longer doing anything to anybody. So that's the great part of it. And in a municipal setting, uh, that's also great. Or even in a yard, lots of people are very much for this. And one little bit of a warning is to try to perhaps make sure that there aren't a lot of parked cars underneath trees at the time of some kind of an application like that. We also have some systemic products, uh, imidacloprid, which is Merit, and Dynatexuran, which is Safari. Homeowners can get, get access to imidacloprid products. And, and that little soft word right there, I practice my little doohickey here. Soft uh, means soft scale in the sense that these, um, the imidacloprid uh, enters the tree in a certain way, and soft scales will uh, suck sap from different parts of tissue. So imidacloprid can be effective systemic for soft scales, but not the armored scale or the hard scale. In contrast to that, the, the safari, the dinotexuran, is in fact uh, effective also against the armored scales. Now I also have down here other, and um, there are lots of other things that even seven is effective against uh, crawlers, et cetera, but we don't generally uh, promote that because in, in this area uh, because of the non-target effects and the harm to the to beneficials. And there are also even some more potent systemics that can sometimes be directly injected into the trees, and that's really not my favorite way of dealing with that. So. Now we have galls on oaks, and again, we do have, I mentioned earlier, we have galls on all sorts of trees, but the oaks seem to have the biggest collection of dramatic ones. And I guess a, a gall, by definition, and I'm making this up, is more or less uh, some of the plant cells gone wild, and it's a bit almost like a tumor, and there can be different insects that create the plant tissue to grow differently for their own protection or benefit. A lot of them are uh, tiny wasps of some flies and certain other insects. And you can get this myriad of very interesting galls that form on the trees. Uh, here's a few others. This uh, gouty oak gall and sweet potato gall, sometimes called, to are pretty evident on some of the larger oak trees, and get a lot of attention and a lot of worry from uh, people out in the public and, and the homeowner, etc. As far as uh, what you can do about it, uh, this is really my recommendation for gall management. Just kind of get out your chair and watch them and enjoy them. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have just plastered trees with pesticides uh, over and over. The timing is really important. The coverage is really important and difficult. And some of these things have alternate hosts. And uh, also, the galls don't go away immediately. For the most part, the galls are not killing the tree. It's a cosmetic thing. So 
treatment has been very expensive and really marginally effective at the best. I had one arborist who told me he was able to affect some management with certain galls by injecting a bidrin or a fairly potent product directly into the tree for at least two consecutive years. So that's really more effort uh, than is worth it as far as I'm concerned. And a little bit of risk to the trees too. It's not, uh, the, the trunk injections or bowl injections are not necessarily uh, without their risks. So now we'll move on to defoliators and I'm just going to start off with the orange striped oak worm. Uh, this uh, critter, little caterpillar, will consume the leaves on oaks primarily in uh, the summer. They get going and then late summer, midsummer, late summer is when they really become noticed. And in the background here we have a uh, line of oak trees at Oak Grove School, as it turns out. And this is, in fact, summer. And these trees have been fairly well defoliated. And they were defoliated for at least three consecutive years. But then the last two years, the, there was no defoliation. And I, my deduction here on this is that these last previous two years, we had a lot of drought. And the ground was very hard because these overwinter in the in the ground and they have to, to go down to pupate and have to come out to emerge and the ground is probably too hard for them to uh, to deal with this little transition. So we have some on campus too and defoliating the tree clearly isn't good for it but it hasn't killed the tree either. Lots of times there can be a bunch of frass and fecal material that's down below the tree so on the sidewalk or on cars, and that's an additional thing that for some reason people don't seem to like caterpillar poop on their cars. But, uh, and, and I think too, these trees are not anywhere near full grown. They're pretty large, but they're not full grown. And larger trees, I haven't seen any full size trees actually being totally stripped. The eastern tent caterpillar, is very common, and that's a springtime caterpillar, a fuzzy caterpillar that webs the crotches of trees, lots of times really um, cherry trees and such like that. They, After they are done consuming the foliage, they crawl off to pupate somewhere, and consequently you can find them crawling all over your house or, or wherever if you had an infestation nearby. Very similar to the fall webworm, except the fall webworm occurs later in the year and webs the uh, ends of the branches instead of the crotches. So here's the, the ends of the branches here. And this is also a little fuzzy caterpillar. Control measures for these, pretty, you, you can use uh, pesticides, but mechanical destruction of the webs works the best. And we'll talk about some caterpillar management in a second. Yeah, this is not recommended generally. Uh, it can cause um, off-target effects, though, though I understand it's a lot of fun. And um, I would love to get this for myself. Now, fall canker worm <clears throat> is something that I don't see very much of, really, here in Raleigh. But I wanted to bring it up because down in Mecklenburg County particularly, for unknown reasons, for decades, this fall canker worm has been a problem. And there are neighborhoods of willow oaks, mature willow oaks in Charlotte that are defoliated and or attacked every year. And there is some place in, in Canada, a little neighborhood in Canada, some town in Canada that has the, the same sorts of problem. And, and I suspect there's other places. Even though this occurs across a lot of the eastern half of the country, uh, the beneficials and the, the predators and, and diseases tend to hold this in check, except for Mecklenburg County. I'm not sure if it had anything to do with the um, bobcats leaving or not. But anyway, it's been going on for quite a while. So the timing of this is like right now, here at this time, 
the caterpillars are out and they're starting to munch on leaves. And they will munch little holes and they'll munch on the edges, et cetera, and make the tree pretty darn ratty. Uh, what happens, though, is in November and December, between um, Thanksgiving and Christmas, the moths, which are um, the female moths anyway, which are in the soil and pupating, will emerge. And this is this is one right there. And they have no wings or, or useless wings. And they crawl up the tree and uh, lay eggs in the branches at the top of the tree. And then those uh, eggs hatch out and turn into the caterpillars that we're talking about right here. So consequently, what you see here with these bands on the trees. These are barriers that have sticky material on them. Hence, that whenever the moths climb up the chunks of the trees, they get stuck in this, and it greatly reduces the number of moths that can get up and lay eggs. So that's, that's been a large part of the control measures for fall canker worm. Uh, they also do a lot of spraying in uh, Charlotte area also for these things. So it's been a bit of a problem for all of those people in that area. Uh, okay, one mentioned bagworms, and bagworms are also caterpillars that will munch on really probably 60 different hosts, lots of different hosts, uh, deciduous and evergreen alike, but they are mostly a problem on the evergreens because they defoliate them and can create a problem with those. So these caterpillars start out in the spring pretty soon. I haven't checked lately, but they start out in the spring and start to munch on the plants. And as the summer goes along, they'll get bigger and bigger in these cases that contain the plant material get bigger and bigger and the plant starts getting more bare, etc. And uh, eventually there, at the end of the summer or early August, the, it could be really bad if nothing is done. So in pest news, here we put out little warnings about when you might start thinking about treating if you have bagworms. And um, we'll give you a little bit of warning, but really, any time before midsummer uh, would be okay. So caterpillar management in general, the hand picking uh, or mechanical destruction of web masses <coughs> or bags works quite well. Now, clearly there are instances when a tree is too tall or you get too many of them that that's not practical. So pesticides might be appropriate. <coughs> Excuse me. And Bacillus thuringiensis is a nice environmental uh, product that a lot of people like. And this is most appropriate in the spring or whenever the caterpillars are small. So that works well. And then there's a list of lots of different things that you can use depending on what your choices and desires are. And we even have an insect growth regulator that is available. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, this is the hemlock woolly adelgid, and it's not exactly a defoliator. I didn't really, it's not a caterpillar, and I didn't know where to stick it, so I just threw it in here. Those of you uh, farther west who deal with the hemlock woolly adelgid, if you had to deal with it, you're probably already familiar with this. But this is a, an introduced insect that is uh, that has been moving down into the state and across the state wherever hemlocks are found, and it's a bit like an aphid, but uh, there are some differences, and it likes to uh, stay protected in this little fuzzy material here, this little woolly material here, so that protects them from predators and somewhat from pesticides, etc. And uh, the management for this, it can, it can, I should mention if you're not familiar with it, it can kill a tree, it can totally defoliate it and do quite a lot of harm. And since this is a major forest tree along the Appalachians all the way up north, then this is quite a serious thing. And a lot of us are very concerned about it. So um, we have some products that fortunately are very effective for hemlock woolly adelgid, but it would really be only in a landscape setting. Uh, I can't 
really do all this in a forest setting. So we have Dinotefuran, which I mentioned is safari already, and Imidacloprid. These are systemics that are taken up by the tree and will kill the adelgid as it is feeding. We have for, uh, as a topical spray, horticultural oils also work fairly well, but then you've got that problem of coverage and if you've got a tall tree, getting it all up into there, etc. We have a few biological uh, predators that have been released. The North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Sciences or Services is uh, raising and releasing these little predatory beetles and um, there has been some benefit to it, but clearly that is not going to be the solution to this whole problem. So down here on the left, we've got a picture of doing some spraying. That's, uh, again, uh, labor intensive and costly. And then also we can apply some systemics to the root zone particularly is, is the best way to get that on in there. <coughs> Now, we also have borers, and I kind of clump these things together as beetles and moths, or maybe I should say I separated them as beetles and moths. Most of the borers, not all of them, but most of the borers fall into these two orders. And amongst this, we have uh, three areas. First is the longhorned beetles. And they have long antennae that look like horns, consequently the long horned beetle. And then we have a bunch of bark beetles and ambrosia beetles. And these tend to be uh, little tiny groups of beetles that uh, feed underneath the bark and oftentimes will cultivate fungi and spread diseases and create all sorts of problems. Then we have the flat headed borers. Uh, these are easily told by this uh, thorax and head area here that is sort of flat from the front anyway. That's why I call them flat head borers. They, they're diagnostic here because of this D-shaped exit hole. The other longhorn beetles are round or round-headed borers are, have round holes. So this flat headed borer has a flat shaped hole. And this is characteristic of this metallic wood boring beetle that we see right here. Uh, so that's the other kind of beetle, major beetle that we have that falls into the boring category as this talk is also. Now twig girdlers aren't really borers but these are long horned beetles and I wanted to mention them because in the landscape, in the home landscape particularly, I think you're going to see this and get some calls on it, so I wanted to mention it. And this uh, longhorn beetle is really very neat because it does a very nice pruning job, girdling job on some of the terminal twigs, cuts it off almost to the end, but not quite, and then this part uh, will break off and fall to the ground and usually you'll see leaves still attached to the branches and you could have a yard with 50 or 100 of these branches uh, on the ground and you know, typically it would be oaks and hickories that you would see this with and the female is going to lay her egg in different places along this twig and then the egg hatches out and stays inside this twig so a great way to get rid of these is pick up all these twigs and destroy them. Don't just throw them in a pile somewhere, but pick them up and destroy them and you, you'll get rid of the twig girdler fairly quickly. Then we have the southern pine bark beetle and this has been around forever and um, periodically has outbreaks and the outbreaks tend to be a bit confined in a sense. Uh, now I say confined, the, it could be a couple of acres, or it could be 50 acres or something like that. And, uh, and if it's your property, then it does concern you. If it happens to be in a nice pine tree next to your house, uh, it will likely die and threaten your house, so you're going to have to do something about it. Um, this is behind my house. Uh, I had about three years ago, seven pine beetles came in there and killed a bunch of the loblollies there. 
and this is kind of, we had a windstorm six or eight months ago, or maybe just six months ago, and uh, a lot of debris fell out of there, and you can see it's not very you know, dark all in this area, it's kind of missing some needles. So it, it can do a, a lot of um, damage there, and the the control for this really, there, there aren't very many um, chemicals that you can use. If you see this attacking your trees uh, and you get on it ahead of time, you can do some protective bark sprays and get a little bit of help out of it. If maybe you had one, if you had two trees in your yard and one was being attacked, you might try to protect the other one. So this is the Southern Pine Bark Beetle Control. And uh, usually one application uh, is sufficient. Basically, you have to cut down the tree and remove it at your earliest convenience to reduce that as a, a reservoir, remove that as a reservoir for attacking other trees. It does provide uh, some impetus for uh, making a cake. This is a uh, stump cake that I made for my father-in-law's birthday. There you go. Okay, so moving right along, I just can't hear all the roaring laughter, uh, unfortunately, on this Illuminate, you know, and the jokes just aren't as rewarding. Oh, oh, all right, some smiley faces. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so moving right along, we have some uh, two hands raised. All right, anyway, oh, thumbs down. Who said that? Mike and Dave, shame on you. Wait till you get up. So we had also want to mention some clear wing uh, moth borers, and the, the clear wing moths uh, they basically all resemble wasps. That is their uh, defense. They mimic wasps, so that birds and things like that will be less likely to attack them. And there's a whole bunch of these. Um, I probably won't remember any of them. Peach tree borer, uh, lilac borer, and I don't know, all these other grapefruit borer. And these little caterpillars, okay, the moths will lay eggs and the and the eggs hatch, and the caterpillars bore into through the bark and get into the the plant, into the, the stems usually, and can do a lot of damage, girdling, etc. And you'll oftentimes see some oozing coming out of the bark. And here we have some uh, of the exuvi, the little pupil skins that are the moths come out of, and they oftentimes stick out of the trees. Uh, a little bit of the uh, the bark protective sprays are a little more effective with this group. So if you have some susceptible things, uh, lots of the autoleucan laurels get uh, borers and uh, peaches and related get borers, and so it may be that you have to resort to some protective sprays on a kind of regular basis to take care of these. Once they get inside, um, not so much you can do really about that. There are lots of pheromone traps for many of these clear wing borers and some of the uh, beetles, so it could be for your timing if you've got an, an issue with these and you expect it then you could put out some pheromone traps and do some uh, protective spraying as soon as they emerge. Probably you're not going to do this in your yard, maybe in a um, more larger setting. So I touched on this borer management or lack of it a little bit earlier. In the past we used lindane and that's gone, uh, dimethoate, that's gone, Durzban, there are only a few instances where Durzban can still be used as a bark spray and uh, your yard and uh, residents are not part of it, so you might as well forget that. So what we are left with is uh, Astro, which is a permethrin product, and Bifenthrin in the um, trade name of Onyx have been used a lot for protective bark sprays and have been fairly successful at that. You see it a lot, and the nursery people use these a lot and uh, are more or less happy with that since we lost Durzban and, and Linde. Now down here I mentioned systemics. Most of these borers will not respond to or, or not be killed by 
a systemic pesticide that is taken up by the plant uh, with, because the product is just not getting into the plant where the borers are. There's one exception, and that is the flat-headed borers, uh, chestnut and lilac borer, um, uh, and emerald ash borer, for example, that get underneath the bark and bore and do a lot of feeding in that cambial layer. So something like imidacloprid or merit would, in fact, have some benefit and protective value for bronze birch borer or whatever might be around there in, in that case. So that's sort of the exception to this whole thing. And we're doing some work, well, not me personally, but entomologists are doing some work to try to find some other systemics that will work for some of these other things. And Fall, I just put fall because that seems to be the recommended time to apply imidacloprid for uh, this type of borer so that it gets up into the tree for spring so that the, the next generation is taken care of. So the, the urban environment now in general has its own set of stresses and if you have the ability to be on the ground floor of planning, then it would behoove you to uh, do whatever you can to minimize stresses in the, in the urban environment. And uh, reducing the tree stress could be related to choosing the correct plant material and uh, whether it's a stress tolerant tree or whatever, uh, picking a good site for it, making sure that it's appropriate plant for that particular site and then preparing the site properly in the first place. So choosing the correct plant material, we have some uh, plants, some trees that are less susceptible to certain problems than others and, and will do okay growing up out of a concrete pot, basically, or, or so on and so forth. But uh, I put this picture down here. This is a hedge maple, and it looks real nice, but I'm looking at this big mulch pile here, which I'm not very crazy about. And then I don't know how far down the street this row of maples go. And if you notice here, I mentioned diversity. If we get anything that takes out all the maples, or takes out all the ashes, or takes out all the elms, or takes out all the chestnuts, or whatever, and we've seen all of that, then you're left with uh, nothing. So um, the monoculture encourages problems and also makes the problems worse than um, they might be otherwise. And think about stuff like ice vulnerability, vulnerability to ice damage. This is a silver maple. And we have ice storms, certainly in the Piedmont area. Uh, and how about Bradford pear? Anybody out there have a Bradford, Bradford pear? Well, we had wind on Saturday, and I saw several Bradford pears that had lost big chunks of limbs. So some of these trees may not really be the, the greatest for an urban environment, though they certainly have been planted. Then do a little bit of uh, forethought. What's this tree going to look like uh, you know, 20 years from now? Many times, the thing that really gets me is how plants are, trees are planted too close to a house, for example, or a street or a road or a driveway because it looks great quickly, but then down the road it ends up being a problem. Maybe you even have to take it out. Then what about uh, the conditions and where are you going to put this? Are you, are you planting a tree basically in a pot uh, along the sidewalk? How's that tree going to do? This could be vandalism or as somebody should, could be neglect or, or transplant shock. But the other part, as somebody reminded me, is the store owners don't really take too kindly to having a nice tree block their sign or their storefront. So, you, you know, who knows what happened here. Maybe the store owner didn't want that tree there. <clears throat> now, preparing the site, you've heard that million dollar hole, and that's really very appropriate, particularly in, in an urban setting, the best preparation you can do. Uh, don't neglect that. Protection, is it something that you have to protect a, an urban tree from vandalism or so on? One time I worked for a nursery and we 
installed, or actually we didn't install, and we sold the town of Newark, I don't know, 200 trees, and in like two weeks' time, somebody had come along and like pulled most of them down and broken them all. So uh, vandalism is a problem, and the setting could also be a problem. Season, this is on campus, behind Gardner Hall. They planted these trees in July a couple of years ago, and you can see that they didn't take too well. So many times you're also, and as as bad and as as this all seems, sometimes it's really not the person's fault who has to install these trees. There may be some uh, regulation about installing landscape before uh, construction, and so you're stuck. But if this is the case, make sure you get some kind of a guarantee on plant replacement because there's a good chance that you're going to have to do that. Or water the heck out of it. Make sure you're on them. There's also environmental problems that can crop up, whether this was wind damage here on the left or uh, vandalism. A wounded tree is much more attractive to insects, and really within hours, insects can locate this. It's, you know, they, they smell almost like blood, uh, the wound, and they will come and can attack a tree. So take care of damaged trees uh, as soon as is possible. And then trees and turf really don't mix. So they are in, in competition with each other for sun and for water and um, so on. And they usually don't like the same fertilizer regimens. So if you've got turf around a tree, mulch it as far out as you can. That would be my recommendation. It will reduce your insect problems in the long run. Mulching. Um, also, this is another tree stress. This is on campus, Centennial campus. And uh, here are these little volcanoes. I, I would just suggest that next time they plant the trees six or eight inches too deeply because this is basically what they're doing. And I've dug down in here. This whole, this whole mess is a mat with uh, grass and other stuff roots growing all through it. And it's not doing the job that it was intended to do as far as protecting the roots. In fact, it's probably shedding water that uh, rainfall that would get down directly to that root zone. Pruning, if you had this kind of a, a situation here, you can see what happens over here to the right. Uh, this tree does not have much of a future. And if this tree were in front of my house, I'd be planting something right near it in anticipation of replacing that uh, fairly shortly. So then you have to think about uh, all these pests and decide what to do. Is, is this pest worth treating in the first place? Uh, yeah, you've got some insects in there. What's it going to do? What if you did nothing? Is the tree going to recover on its own? And if you do have to treat then what's going to be the cost to treat? So uh, you know, if it's just a cosmetic thing, are you going to spend a couple hundred dollars for a cosmetic issue? It, maybe you would, but you know you have to make that decision. We have lots of options, uh, non-chemical things that we've mentioned, certain biological control, we, whether it's passive biological control or active. And we have different choices of chemicals, uh, those that are less harmful to the environment or the beneficials and those that might be more persistent, if, if that's what's required. Trees, uh, pesticides can be applied to trees as foliar spray, bark sprays, uh, soil injections or drenches underneath, um, trunk or bowl injections, and in some cases, uh, aerial sprays yeah, even are out there. So kind of summarizing this, you need to identify what pests you've got out there, because that's going to determine all these other decisions that you're going to make and decide whether you have to do anything, if it's worth doing anything at all in the first place, and, and choose the best treatment that you've got. And then uh, just as a routine, uh, try to reduce tree stress factors. And I didn't mention we had several years of drought, and the West probably still has some drought there. But if you've got a specimen tree, if you're not paying too big a water bill, 
then it may be very much worth your while to water a tree. Uh, it's a lot of water, but to water a tree to keep that hydrated and healthy so it is less likely to have some problems. This is our website. I plug this pretty much every talk for our insect notes, insects.ncsu.edu. And uh, we're going to close up with just about five more slides. And I wanted to mention these just future threats of trees. And the first one, and you probably heard of all of these, I guess, but the first one is the emerald ash borer. And this is one of the flathead borers. And you see it's not very big. It's smaller than the head of a penny. And it is a prime threat to ash trees. That's ASH, I said. I hope my microphone was working properly. Um, now, it has been, all right, now it's been uh, transported. You can see down here in the lower corner, it's a real problem in kind of the mid, let's say, south of the Great Lakes, maybe. But uh, a year or so ago, it was found in Fairfax, Virginia. So it's moving right along. And with Fairfax, maybe it's over here. I don't know. So it's moving right along. It's moving south. And uh, you can see the damage here. But what's more important about this picture is that this is a picture of like firewood. And moving firewood is really a no-no. Um, under no circumstances should you really be moving firewood from any zone very far to another, because there's lots of stuff that has been transported by firewood that has created all sorts of problems. Then we have the Red Bay Ambrosia Beetle. And this is, uh, I can't remember the date, like 2004 or, let me see, no, 1999, okay, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was introduced uh, down here near uh, Charleston area or so. And it, it is uh, mostly a problem down here in this area. But you see it's starting to go north from South Carolina. And Red Bay, you may not think of it too much as a serious tree. But especially in the maritime forests, it's a, a major tree and seems to perhaps wipe out 60, 75 percent of the Red Bay trees that are there. And there can be some very large trees, actual real tree size. We think of these a bit more as an understory tree, but some very large trees that can be present uh, down in this area. So this is one of these ambrosia beetles, and it uh, transmits the disease and creates laurel wilt disease. So we're looking forward to that, but not very much. Then the Asian longhorn beetles got gotten lots of press. This had infestations in the Chicago area. And supposedly, they have gotten that under control. Uh, but in the New York City area, it is still a problem. Uh, it's been a bit more, uh, the New Yorkers haven't quite regulated it as well as the people in the Chicago area. So it's still around. And I'm not quite sure whether this is going to ever be eradicated or not. But uh, they're working on it. And this longhorn beetle attacks uh, a wide variety or a wider variety of hardwoods. So that's something to look forward to. Now here's a new one. I think this is my last one here. I say new. This is the walnut twig beetle. This is another ambrosia beetle. And this transmits a thousand canker disease on black walnuts. And you can see so far, it's out here in uh, Colorado. So hopefully, but we have black walnuts here. And hopefully, it won't make this jump anytime soon. But this would be just one more threat to one more kind of tree that we have in uh, North Carolina. We got, we we're blessed with so many different wonderful trees. And consequently, that gives us opportunity to have attacks from lots of different ones. Oh. I did forget this Cyrex wood wasp. This hasn't turned out to be quite as bad as we all thought, but it's still a potential problem. And this little wood wasp attacks living pines. This is introduced also. Living pines. And right now, it's in New York and Indiana. And they are doing their very best to try to eradicate this and monitor it. But 
Uh, we do have pines down here in North Carolina, so that's something we've got to keep our eye on. So these are some people we should thank. And um, that's basically the end. And if you've got any questions, we can probably take like three or four minutes on the questions. And don't forget, so there's that applause button. <laughs> and if you want to ask a question, if you'll hit the hand raise, then we'll be sure to get to all of them in order. You don't have to ask a question. Okay, well, oh, we do have a question. Go, who, how do we do this here? Katie. John, you got that? Or Lee? Yeah, okay. yeah Katie, who? Go ahead Can and you please go back over what the growth regulator was when you were talking with the bagworms uh, and beetles? The, yeah, that was Bimelin, I think, if I recall. And I'm not sure how um, how effective Bimelin is on the on the beetle bores, but it is fairly useful on a lot of some of the um, fly and the lepidoptera, the caterpillars. And that's, you know, sometimes the municipalities and the governments will spray that, hoping that it's going to be more safe to the population. Steve, can you spell the name of, can you spell out that product name for us, please? Okay, it's D-I-M-I-L-I-N, and I may even be able to write it. That's the trade name. I can't quite remember what the actual active ingredient is. We have another question. Uh, any beetle you see with the antenna that wrap all the way around to, uh, to the back of it, would that be an Asian longhorn? No, not at all. There are a few beetles that are fairly similar, have that same shape and are black and white. So um, there, there's a website that I came across some time ago that has Asian longhorn beetle look-alikes, or things that are commonly mistaken for the Asian longhorn beetle. So if you Google Asian longhorn beetle, I think you'll probably come across that. But uh, it looks like a lot of longhorn beetles. It's, it's not that different, except for certain markings. Okay, Steve, we had a question um, in the chat room. Um, Robert has asked if you can suggest pesticides registered for diamondback moth on collards. The answer to that is no, because <laughs> I don't know that well. However, BT should work okay for that. Um, and maybe while Mike is talking, I will Google something and see what I can find out are the current recommendations for that. Or one of the agents who probably deals more with vegetables could chime in here. Come on, Ann Edwards. I know you know the answer to that. Cindy, speak up. OK, let's, um, I'll be around here. And if we've got time at the end, we'll answer some more questions. But let's make sure that the other two speakers have enough time. So um, I'm going to turn it back to somebody, Lucy, maybe. I'll take it back from you. And Anne echoed your BT recommendation for the, the moth on collars. Okay. okay, thank you, Steve. Okay.